Well, since it's Easter, let's say it again. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Glory is risen Hallelujah. It's not Easter Sunday, but it's Easter season still. Good morning. It's good to be back here with you at St. Thomas. Leslie is here with me, and, and some of you know this, but uh, St. Thomas is sort of our parish church. You know, as the bishop, I belong to the whole diocese, but we live just a few blocks from here in Nina, so St. Thomas is our parish church, and it's good to be here, and it's good to be in a place where the Spirit is so evidently present uh, amongst you all. Uh, you're led by uh, some fine clergy, as you know, in Father Ralph and Father Aaron, leaders not just here for you all, but leaders in the diocese, and um, the folk, especially Father Ralph, somebody that I call uh, every now and then when I want some advice. So you've got some and, and, and you all know you've got a lot of uh, retired clergy sprinkled around here as well, some fine clergy, but this congregation also is a leader in the diocese. A lot of lay members uh, of this congregation are leaders in the diocese, and I am uh, immensely grateful for you all. And today we're going to do baptisms, confirmations, receptions, and first communion. So that's like a, a home run of bishop and priest and church kind of thing. So uh, that's another sign that there's life here. Um, it is good to be with you this morning. I love the, the line uh, that uh, was uh, read just before the epistle. If you were paying attention to that little introduction blurb uh, where it was suggested that it would be a good thing for us to be transformed by the power of his love. Did you hear that? May we be transformed by the power of his love. How many here want to be transformed by the power of his love? Good, you should all raise your hands, right? How many of you think you need that transformation? All right, you should all raise your hands too, right? I'll speak for myself. I need, I need that transformation. There are parts of me that need transforming, that need converting. Even if you're a bishop, you need to keep being converted and transformed by the power of his love. And the lessons this morning, especially the, the epistle and the gospel, are a lot about that transformation. How do we become more and more transformed? The gospel and the epistle pretty much tell us if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and we give our life over to Him, and if we seek to follow in His footsteps, the footsteps of the sacrificial love that He is about, and we place ourselves in a place where His Spirit can work in us, if we abide in Him as he says in the gospel, and as 1 John also encourages, if we abide in him, if we sink our heart into the heart of God, we will be transformed. We will be healed. We will experience forgiveness. We will experience freedom and transformation. if we abide in Him and in His love. I've spoken uh, often since I've been here as bishop about God's love, God's grace, which are pretty nearly the same thing, being uh, about His mercy and His delight. Delight is just another way of talking about love, it seems to me. Delight is love plus attention and attentiveness plus joy. And isn't that the mark of Jesus? Jesus loves the people that he comes into, count, in, into contact with. And if you pay attention to the gospel, every person he engages, he gives them his full attention. And he shares with them the delight that he embodies as the Son of God. So he delights in the people who he encounters. God delights in his creation, and God delights in every one of us. 
In the Old Testament, one of the words that is used, uh, that is translated delight, the word chafetz, uh, has as its root meaning to bend toward, which is a, del- a delightful image, that God delights in us, God bends towards us just like we bend towards our children or, or anything else that we cherish and delight in. Maybe you have something that you, you delight in, an object, and, and you cherish it and you bend towards it with your attention and care. God bends towards us in His delight. And Jesus is that ultimate bending towards us, bringing His mercy and delight into our midst And in that mercy and delight, we are transformed. If we invite him to shape our lives and our heart, if we follow in his footsteps, which are the footsteps of his mercy and delight, and we learn to see ourselves and the world and all creation and every other person we encounter with his mercy and delight, we will be transformed. And to do that, we need to abide in him. Abide in Him in prayer, primarily in the Eucharist and other sacraments, but we abide in Jesus by coming alongside Him and quietly sitting with Him in His presence in prayer. And sometimes that prayer is is us talking to God and telling God what's on our minds and hearts and and, uh, what's troubling us. But sometimes, and I think in a, in a culture like ours, which is full of noise and words, sometimes prayer is just sitting quietly and inviting Jesus to work his transformation on us. One prayer, ancient, ancient prayer that I have come to appreciate very much and, and to practice regularly is called the Jesus Prayer. And some of you are probably familiar with this ancient prayer. It's a prayer where you just repeat, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Sometimes you can add on mercy on me. Uh, sometimes uh, on mercy, have mercy on me, a sinner, if you're particularly needing that kind of mercy. But mercy is more than just forgiving us for our sins. Mercy is about transforming us, healing us, uh, giving us clarity when we are confused, giving us direction when we're feeling lost. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. And I like to pray that prayer. Just sit quietly and pray it and let God's mercy wash over me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. I need transforming. I need healing. I need forgiveness. I need clarity and direction. I need comfort. I need peace. I need freedom from the things that bind me. All of that is about His mercy. And then sometimes when I'm, I'm feeling uh, a little more ambitious in my prayer, I'll pray God's mercy on other people. And uh, it's, it's fun to pray God's mercy on the people that I love and care about. Uh, and if I'm feeling a little more like I want to be a little more like Jesus, I'll start praying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on whoever it is that is, is uh, in my head or in my life that's troubling me. Uh, and uh, and that's a good practice. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, try this. Uh, this is just a, a little uh, helpful tool. While you're watching the news, when, when that politician or person comes on who pushes your every button and makes you want to scream and throw stuff at the TV, don't do that, but say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on and, and actually name that person. And you might not mean it the first time or the second time or the 25th time. But keep praying it, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on that person. Because whoever it is, they need God's mercy, right? You might not know what kind of mercy they need, but Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and allow that to shape your heart. That's abiding in Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. I need your help. I need your healing. I need your transforming love. I need your forgiveness. Abide in Jesus and allow him to work on your heart and on your spirit, and you will be transformed. And I hope that that each of you can, uh, if you think about your life, you can can remember points in your life when you have particularly experienced some of that mercy 
and delight, that transforming love. Maybe it's been over a long time of subtle transformation. Maybe there have been points of radical transformation and conversion. And maybe you've had more than one of those, but I hope you've had at least some taste of that transformation. I want to share with you uh, uh, a story from my own life of a time when I experienced some of that transformation, that transforming power of his love. And I won't give you the, the whole setup because we've got an awful lot going on this morning, but I was in seminary and I was doing a program called Clinical Pastoral Education where I was thrown into a hospital to do pastoral care for people who were sick and dying and, and grappling with all the issues and questions that come with that, plus some other stirrings in my own life and remembering things that uh, had not been healed as much as I would have liked them to be healed from my past. And one night I was on call at the hospital as this chaplain intern. And I was ruminating and, and thinking about a whole host of things about, that, about which I was confused or troubled or disturbed. And I had uh, what I will call a graced image uh, that I believe God you know, provided me with, this graced image. And here's, here's the image. I was about 14 years old, which is an important age for me that we don't need to go into, but I was about 14 years old looking out of a window of a tower of a castle. And the rest of the castle was uh, in various states of disrepair or distract, destruction, like it had been uh, attacked and also neglected. And as I looked out onto the land around the castle, the land also looked like it had been uh, devastated, run over by an army, and everything was trampled and uh, destroyed, damaged. And I understood that to be kind of the, the state of my own spirit at that moment. And there was a, a path, there was a moat around the castle and a path that led into the distance. And uh, as the image continued to unfold a little bit, a figure walked, came walking down the path. And at first, I couldn't really tell very much, but as the figure got closer, it was clear that it was a woman but a woman whose age I couldn't quite determine. It could be she was very old or very young. Either way, she was indescribably beautiful. And she came closer and closer, and she got to the edge of the moat, and she sat down and dangled her bare feet, her bare toes in the water, and she looked up at me, and she began to sing. And the words of the song are not terribly complex, but for me at the moment, they were... Trans, pro profound and transforming. The song was just, be at peace, you are beloved, come down from the castle and let's begin to heal the land. Let's begin to heal the land of your spirit. And I, I took that figure to be the Holy Spirit singing to me, inviting me into a deeper place of transformation and healing and forgiveness. There were places in my life that had not yet been touched by God's mercy and delight. There were parts of my history that I had not completely been healed of. There were any number of things that needed healing and transforming and forgiving. And I can tell you that that was another moment in my life where God's mercy and delight became even more real. And I was transformed, not by any stretch of the means transformed into perfection. That's a long ways to go. But another step along the way. And I haven't had many of those kinds of, of big experiences of God's presence and mercy and delight. Uh, but there have been a lot of other smaller things along the way, and it doesn't have to be a profound experience. It can be lots of many subtle experiences, but I hope you have experienced some of that mercy and delight, that transforming power of God's love. And if you haven't, I invite you to invite Jesus to pour out his mercy and delight on your heart and begin to abide in him quietly, praying 
that prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me because I need healing. I need forgiveness. I need freedom from shame and fear. I need clarity. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me and transform my heart and my life so that I can live with your freedom and joy and love more and more. Now here's just a, a bit of a caveat here. Uh, Jesus loves us and desires to pour out his mercy and delight on us, but his mercy is not always nice uh, because sometimes what needs to happen is things that are in our life and are in our heart, ways of being and thinking and habits that get in the way of our being able to receive that mercy and delight, get in the way of our being able to share that mercy and delight. And that's where Jesus says in the gospel, sometimes when God comes alongside us, he starts doing some pruning. There are some dead branches of selfishness and greed and malice and anger and impatience and selfishness that need to be pruned away. And sometimes I'm attached to those branches and I'm not sure I want them to be pruned. And maybe you've had that experience too. Jesus comes along and says, you gotta let go of that resentment. You gotta let go of that anger. You need to forgive that person. And you think to yourself, I'm not sure I wanna do that. But if we allow Jesus to work in us, he will prune us so that we can bear more fruit and experience more and more of his mercy and his delight. So I encourage us all, and I encourage myself to again and again set aside time to abide in Jesus in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And then seek to again and again go out and practice what we pray. Lord, let me be the presence of your mercy and delight in the world around me and to each person I meet. And I promise you that if you do that over time in ways dramatic and not so dramatic, your heart and your life will be transformed by the power of his love.